What is up, Dirty Medicine subscribers? In today's video, we are going to be talking about signal transduction. Dun, dun, dun. I know that's what you're all thinking. You're like, damn it, I hate this topic. Before I get into today's video, please consider clicking the join button on my channel to sign up to be a Dirty Medicine member. When you click the join button, you will pay $4.99 a month in financial support of my channel. And in exchange for that financial support, you'll get the awesome Dirty Medicine logo, which will appear after your username anytime you comment anywhere on the channel publicly. You'll also get access to the locked community tab section on my channel where you can vote or comment your recommendation slash request for the topic of my next video. Any financial support that you can provide is so very much appreciated. But it doesn't matter if you don't donate, I'm still going to make the free videos anyway. So in this video, we are going to be talking about a major topic in biochemistry and immunology, and this is signal transduction. I cannot stress enough how high yield and important this topic is for a couple reasons. One, clinically, the second messenger system is so important, it literally has its hand in everything in the human body. It controls so much of biochemistry and endocrinology and neurology and neuroscience and psychiatry. It's literally in every topic. So clinically, it's really important to understand the foundation of how all of that communication works. But then as far as USMLE or COMLEX is concerned, it's a really high yield topic. I think that test writers know that medical students just cannot stand studying this. They punt this, they chalk this up and figure, you know what? If I get a question, I'm just going to take a guess, and that's that. But no, 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 you're not going to do that. That is a defeatist attitude, and here at Dirty Medicine, I do not believe in giving up what should be free points. So in this video, I'm going to teach you everything that you need to know to get most, if not all, of your questions correct when it comes to signal transduction. So let's get started by talking about G-protein couple receptors. So where do we begin? Well, we've got a plasma membrane, which you see here on the slide. And embedded within that plasma membrane is a receptor. And this is the G-protein coupled receptor. And if you look at the plasma membrane here, the receptor portion has this seven transmembrane domain that kind of goes in and out, in and out, and it loops in and out from the intra and extracellular side. Now on the extracellular side, you see that little cup and that's where our signal's going to bind. But this is the receptor. Now the receptor is connected to or associated with a G protein network. And that G protein network is com consists of three subunits, hence the name heterotrimeric G protein. It's a trimeric, tri meaning three, three subunits. So we've got the gamma, alpha, and beta subunit. Now how this works is the signal binds to the little cup of the receptor, which you see in the upper left-hand part of this slide. And when that happens, you get a little bit of conformational change within the trimeric protein subunits of the G protein. So the gamma and the beta subunits stay up around the plasma membrane, but that alpha subunit kind of dissociates a bit. And I'm oversimplifying this for the purposes of explaining it. It doesn't quite work like this exactly in space. But on that alpha subunit, you get the conversion of GDP to GTP. And when the GTP is on the alpha subunit of the G protein, you have a GTP bound alpha subunit that's now active. Now when the alpha subunit is active, it can act in one of a few ways. It can be G sub S or G sub I. The G sub S activates adenylcyclase. And adenylcyclase's role is to convert ATP into CAMP. And then CAMP will activate protein kinase A or PKA. And then PKA will have further downstream secondary messenger effects. So G sub S activates adenylcyclase, which catalyzes the conversion from ATP to CAMP, and then CAMP goes on to activate protein kinase A. So big picture here, G proteins, alpha GS stimulates, S for stimulates, adenylcyclase, which turns on CAMP, which turns on PKA. Now GI, I for inhibitory, does the opposite. It inhibits adenylcyclase, 
which never allows the conversion of ATP to CAMP, which never allows PKA to be activated, which never allows PKA to go on and carry out its secondary messenger effects. So alpha subunit of the G protein can either stimulate through GS or inhibit through GI. Now, there's another function that the alpha subunit can have that's not GS and that's not GI. And instead of working through adenocyclase and then CAMP and then PKA, it works through a completely different system. So I'm going to show that on the right-hand side of the slide. So to be clear, we're still talking about a G protein coupled receptor where the signal binds to the receptor, it induces the little bit of conformational change, GDP still goes to GTP, you still get activation of the alpha subunit of the G protein. And this is where we start to get a little different here. So instead of stimulating through GS or inhibiting through GI, you're going to get stimulatory action, but through GQ. And GQ will go on to activate phospholipase C. Now phospholipase C will activate the conversion of PIP2 to IP3 plus DAG, D-A-G. And it's IP3 and DAG, which each carry out unique effects. So IP3 causes a release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. And DAG activates protein kinase C, or PKC. Now, the combination of calcium being released from the endoplasmic reticulum and protein kinase C being activated by DAG will both have further downstream effects, particularly calcium, which will go on to activate a whole host of enzymes and carry out secondary messenger functions. So on the right part of this slide, the big picture idea is that alpha subunit of G protein works through GQ, which stimulates phospholipase C, which stimulates PIP2 into both IP3 and DAG. IP3 causes calcium release, DAG activates protein kinase C, and then both calcium and PKC will go on and carry out downstream secondary messenger effects. So huge picture, let's pause, take one big step back and look at this big picture. What's happening? A G protein coupled receptor can cause either the activation of protein kinase A, the inhibition of protein kinase A, or the activation of both calcium and protein kinase C. And depending on what the effect or the intended effect is through the secondary messenger system, protein kinase A, calcium, and protein kinase C can go on to have further intracellular control. So that's the big picture of what's going on here. And now the question in your mind, I can hear it right now, dirty, how do we remember this? So here's my mnemonic. Again, big picture, G protein turns on adenylcyclase, turns on CAMP, which turns on PKA. So my mnemonic is that you go to AC for craps and poker. So I know gambling is legal in a lot of areas now, but back in the day, you really had to either go to Las Vegas out in the West or Atlantic City or AC over on the East Coast. So you go to AC for craps and poker. G for G protein, AC for adenylcyclase, the C in craps is the C in camp, and the P in poker is the P in PKA. So dumb mnemonic, I get it, but it's better than nothing. Now, the only other thing that I need to mention about this G protein coupled receptor pathway are the types of endocrine hormones that are under the control of the various elements of this signaling pathway. So when it comes to the camp pathway, the endocrine hormones that are under the influence of this pathway is everything that you see on this slide. So we've got FSH, LH, ACTH, TSH, CRH, HCG, ADH, uh, and that's specific to the V2 receptor, MSH, PTH, calcitonin, GHRH, glucagon, and then histamine. And specific to histamine, we're talking about the H2 receptor. So these are all of the endocrine hormones under the control of CAMP. And then likewise, we need to talk about the endocrine hormones under the control of IP3. So this is working through the other 
part of the G-protein-coupled receptor pathway through GQ, phospholipase C, and then IP3. So IP3 controls things that you see on this slide. So GnRH, oxytocin, ADH at the V1 receptor, TRH, histamine, this time specific to the H1 receptor, angiotensin 2, and gastrin. So these are all under the control of IP3. Now let's switch gears and talk about the next type of signal transduction pathway. We're going to talk about receptor tyrosine kinases. Receptor tyrosine kinases are actually the largest class of signal transductors. And these are very unique because receptor tyrosine kinases actually have inherent enzyme activity. So yes, it's a receptor, but it also is technically an enzyme. Hence the name receptor tyrosine kinase. Now, how does this work? So growth factors or local signaling molecules will bind on top of the receptor tyrosine kinases. And when this happens, it kind of forces the two components or the two receptor tyrosine kinases to move close to one, get to one another and link up, also known as dimerization. So now we have the formation of a dimer. And then the dimer undergoes this really unique process known as cross-phosphorylation. So pretty much what's going on here is that the, the tyrosine kinase activity in each of these dimers cross-phosphorylate each other. So they're, they're literally phosphorylating tyrosines on the other receptor tyrosine kinase. And this whole process that you see here with my little white lines showing you that it's crossing is known as cross-phosphorylation. Now the result of this cross-phosphorylation is that you get this thing called an SH2 domain. And that's basically a binding site up on the top of the receptor tyrosine kinase where various enzymes and other molecules can bind to to kick off complex signal transduction. So let's take this one step further and just imagine that you've got these dimerized receptor tyrosine kinases and they're sitting there just ready to do their job. So along comes this ROS, R-A-S, and typically ROS is inactive when it has GDP bound to it. But once the signaling molecule at the top of the receptor tyrosine kinase, which is here shown in light blue, binds, you get dimerization, you get cross-phosphorylation, ROS binds to the SH2 domain, and then ROS can become activated. So the way that that happens is that the GDP gets exchanged for the GTP, and now you've got activated RAS. And now RAS will undergo this complex pathway where it basically will go to RAF, which will go to MEC, which will go to ERK. And it's not important that you understand what each of these things are doing, but what is important is that you understand that as you go down through this pathway, you have the presence of what's known as activators. And these are serine threonine kinases in the MAP kinase cascade. And basically what's happening here is because all of these kinases are activators and control this pathway at each step of the way. So as you see here, MAP kinase 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 controls RAF, MAP kinase kinase controls MEC, and MAP kinase controls ERK. So pretty much as you go down, you just drop a kinase each time. Um, but the big picture here is that because each of these kinases phosphorylate multiple substrates, as you go down, that initial signal pretty much gets amplified. So this leads to a very strong output at the bottom of this transduction cascade, which can then go on to regulate lots of different transcription products, and this will have pretty profound effects as this moves throughout the, the cell. So this is a very complex pathway, but for the purposes of USMLE or COMLEX, really what you need to know is that it is how the receptor tyrosine kinase works back at the top, so dimerization, cross-phosphorylation, ROS, ROF, MEC, ERK, and as you go down, you have activators, MAP, kinase, 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 and then just drop one kinase as you go down. So that's kind of the big picture with a lot of nitty-gritty details woven in in between. And just like we talked about with G-protein coupled receptors, it's really important to know the different endocrine products which are controlled by this pathway. So just to summarize, as you see on this slide, receptor tyrosine kinases control insulin, IGF-1, FGF, PDGF, and EGF. But dirty, how the hell will I remember the pathway? All right, so my mnemonic here is when you think of receptor tyrosine kinase, think 
RTK, receptor tyrosine kinase, RTK. And RTK should remind you ROS3 kinases. So what does this tell you? you? All of this is kicked off by ROS, and then three kinases reminds you that the next thing after ROS starts with MAP kinase kinase kinase, and then three kinases as you go down, just drop a kinase. So RTK, receptor tyrosine kinase, R for ROS, T for 3, K for kinase. And then if you know that you're starting with the 3 kinase map after ROS, just drop a kinase as you go down. Simple, done, easy points. So that's receptor tyrosine kinases. The final signal transduction pathway that we need to talk about, and honestly, it's the easiest one to learn and to memorize, so I saved it for last so that you can end on a high note and feel like you dominated this video, is the CGMP pathway. So the CGMP pathway is just pretty simple, so I'm just gonna fly through it. So you've got nitric oxide, which basically comes inside of the membrane and interacts with guanylate cyclase. Guanylate cyclase converts GTP into CGMP, and then CGMP goes on to activate protein kinase G. The reason I think that this pathway is just a little bit easier to remember and put all these things together into this one box is because pretty much everything in this pathway with the exception of nitric oxide has the letter G. So guanylate has G, CGMP has G, protein kinase G ends with G. So this is all the G's which get started by nitric oxide. Now, the endocrine hormones that are controlled in this pathway are BNP, ANP, and EDRF. And just as like a big picture idea, you just want to know that the CGMP pathway has really profound effects on smooth muscle. So this pathway has a lot of effects on vasodilation. So for USMLE and Comlex, just know that nitric oxide kicks off all the Gs. So guanylate, CGMP, PKG and that it controls BNP, ANP, and EDRF. And that is it for this video. I know it was a lot of nitty gritty information, but it's all very high yield. So make sure you know this information well.